So 1 Kings, uh, the book, ends today. There's only two chapters left, 21 and 22. And before we get into 21, I want to just reflect on the things that this book, 1 Kings, has invited us to wrestle with and consider. The first that I would propose to you is this trajectory that we've seen through the entire book where at the very beginning of the book, things, things were doing pretty well. As a whole, Israel was one nation and they, their hearts were devoted to the Lord. David was an older man. Solomon was about to become king. When he does become king, one of the first things he does is he builds a temple for the Lord and the heart of the people are set after honoring God. And by the end of this book, everything is completely flipped. The people have given themselves over to sin and we've plotted the trajectory of how we got here and it's compromise after compromise after compromise. Allowance after allowance after allowance. This guy disobeys the Lord and marries some woman who worships a pagan foreign god and she wants to bring her foreign pagan gods into the marriage and then the dad says, well, I, I don't know who we should really give ample time to. Do we spend time worshiping Yahweh or do we give ourselves to Molech? Well, I, how about we just do both? And so the nation starts building these shrines at high places of worship and they give themselves over to all kinds of worship and their hearts drift far away from Yahweh. And by the end of the book, we've got this, this trajectory of the spiral of sin where one compromise doesn't ever resolve the issues that you think the compromise is gonna resolve. It only leads to more compromise, which is a huge thing for us to consider today that the tension that you feel and you're convinced that if you just compromise on this one issue, it'll resolve the tension, that's a lie. And the father of lies deals in lies. That giving in on this one area is not gonna resolve any tension. It's only going to lead you to a place where you're gonna have to compromise more and more and more. That's the spiral that we see in 1 Kings. So that's the first thing that, it, and that, that this book has showed us. The other thing that it has showed us is the difference between God's timing and our timing. It isn't the same. Now, I think we all walked in here knowing that that's not uh, news to us, but what is news to us is how long God's timing is. Like we're, okay, we're comfortable with like, okay, Lord, I, I know it's gonna take a long time, but when you say long time, that's a long, long time. I heard a preacher one time say um, that the mill of God grinds very slowly, but it grinds fine powder into dust. That's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a God who makes a promise and doesn't fulfill it for a thousand years. We're dealing with a God who says, if you don't turn, there's gonna be judgment, but then gives the people 700 years to turn in repentance. The timing between the way God deals with things and the timing with which the way we deal with things, it's much slower. And in that timing, there's this other thing that pops up, which is the contrast of this mercy and judgment. And one of the things that kind of blows our understanding of the Old Testament out of the water is we've been taught that the Old Testament is where the angry God lives and the New Testament is where the nice God lives. But we've seen the quite, quite, quite something different. When we go through the Old Testament, God is passionate about justice and passionate about people obeying his word. He will not move on that, but he's patient with them. And he's kind. The God of the Old Testament is kind. Next year when we get into the Minor Prophets, you're going to be amazed at how many oracles to the nations there are. There's almost as many oracles to the nations as there are to Israel. Nations he has no covenant with, but in his desire he cries out to them, repent and turn from your sin. So there's this this contrast of God's mercy and his judgment, he's patient and he's kind and he's serious about you being obedient, but he's patient 
and you walking in that obedience. All of these themes are brought to a culmination or um, uh, a mountaintop. Uh, they're, they're brought to a crescendo in 1 Kings 21 and 22, which is why I want to spend just a few minutes reflecting on what we've learned in this book, because everything is finally brought to a, 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 just a nice little bow, and, and it just says all these things we've been talking about, I want you to see all of these in the last two chapters. All the stuff you've been wrestling with, it is, it, there, there is no better story than these last two chapters for you to understand God's mercy and his judgment and his long suffering and his timing. These two chapters cover it all, the spiral of sin and what God do, does with it. So these themes that are gonna culminate in, one in 21 and 22 and they culminate with this one family. It's the king of the north, Nations have split, Israel's in the north, Judah's in the south, the king of the north, his name is Ahab, and he's married this foreign woman named Jezebel who is a manipulative, seductive woman who brought her gods into the marriage and controls Ahab. He's the kind of guy who grew up around God stuff and he still has this weird little tie to wanting to be obedient. It's almost like a superstition. It's very similar to the kind of Christianity that you see permeate America. There's this sense that we have some, um, some obligation to walk in obedience to our creator. But if you just ask the average person, where did that sense of justice come from? Uh, I don't know. The sense that like women have value, where did that come from? I had no clue. The idea that, that children, they have value and they should be honored and protected, where does that come from? Uh, I, I don't know. It comes from here, it comes from God's heart, it comes from his desire, he's the one who put that stuff. This is truth, this is reality. And so what you're seeing is you've got this guy named Ahab and this lady named Jezebel, and they're married, and they're wicked leaders, and they've been offered repentance numerous times, and they don't take it. And so what you're seeing is the culmination of God's long suffering, his timing, and his mercy, but you're gonna see judgment. God was kind in offering revival to Israel and, 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 and killing 400 prophets of Baal and raining fire to heaven, but after that moment last week where Elijah's sitting on the mountain and God says, all right, there's not gonna, I'm not gonna be in the fire and the wind and the earthquakes anymore. I'm gonna be in a still small voice and the still small voice is gonna be a voice of judgment. No one is gonna es escape the sword. Judgment is coming. And how judgment comes is what we look at in 1 Kings 21 through 22. So if you open your Bibles, go to 1 Kings 21. We're gonna read the first couple verses. What we do around here is we read a little bit, and then I stop and talk a little bit, expound on a little bit, and we get back into it. So typically I, I read longer sections, but I wanna read just the first two verses and then pause and get a sense for where we're headed and why this story is so important. So 1 Kings 21, one says this. Now Nabot, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Just a pause, at this point there are two locations. There is a castle that Ahab's dad built in Samaria, that's the formal capital city of Israel in the north, but Ahab had a summer home, his own personal house in Jezreel, so he's ruling from both places and he kinda, he spends his time split between those castles. So one of those castles, Jezreel, which was in the north, had a vineyard just outside of it owned by a man named Nabot, and Ahab decided he wanted that vineyard. Verse two says, after, and after this Ahab said to Nabot, give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near my house. And I will give you a better vineyard for it, or if it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. Now, let's just pause. We're at the end of the book. Why are we talking about this guy's vineyard? You would expect that there should be like some war or battle. Why does the author take us on this trajectory where the last two chapters were this massive experience where fire's raining out of heaven and then Elijah's sitting on a mountain and God is speaking to him and he's calling, okay, you're gonna go anoint Elisha the prophet and, and this new king's gonna come in and then all of a sudden we take this weird trajectory and now we're talking about this guy's vineyard. Why is the story included? Those are the questions I wanna encourage you to start asking as you're reading through. It's not just because this chapter popped up and oh well, we're gonna take a different, no, all of these stories, they flow together. It's a narrative, it's a story. So why is this one here? 
It's because this story, the author wants you to hear because there is no greater story that explains why judgment is coming to Israel. What you're about to read in this story is going to explain to you why God is so angry over Israel and he's bringing judgment to the house of Ahab and Jezebel. This story, if I were going to explain to you like this big concept about something, and I wanna give you one little parable, that's what this is. This story is an anecdote that explains everything wrong with Israel. And there's a couple things that are hidden in here, the little gems that I wanna bring out to you. The first thing was that the land that was given to Israel, God commanded in Leviticus 25, 23, that this was God's land. This plot of soil in Israel, it belonged to Yahweh. This was God's land, and he was giving it to Israel in order to steward. This is your little piece of property, I want you to look after it for me. It's not yours, it's mine and I want you to look after it. And the rule is that because it's not yours, you don't get to sell it. You don't sell it to anybody, you don't give it away, you keep it in the family and you protect this little plot of land. That's the rule. The other thing that stands out here is this reference, this phrase that was um, brought out in Deuteronomy 11.10. What Ahab wants to do with the vineyard is to tear it up and plant a vegetable garden. Now, what's so special about vegetable gardens? Well, vegetable gardens need to be replanted every single year, whereas vineyards, you just kind of plant them and then they grow, and every year they grow a little bit more and you just kind of steward it. It's a parable or a reflection off of what God is doing versus what man is doing. God is making this thing grow and it's just continuing to grow each year and you're a steward of it. But as a vegetable garden, you go out and you, you plant and then you just turn up the soil and nothing's gonna grow unless you're gonna plant it. The work is on you rather than the work being on God. And in Deuteronomy eleven twelve, when God is describing to Israel this land they're coming into, which is the land that they live on right now, that's being disputed, that Ahab wants to buy, the Lord says in Deuteronomy eleven ten, for the land that you are entering to take possession of it is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come. Listen to what he says. This land of Israel is not like Egypt. Why is it not like Egypt? Because in Egypt, you sowed seeds and irrigated it like a garden of vegetables. The author wants you to pick up, before the story even unfolds, that Ahab's desire is to turn Israel into Egypt. He wants to bring the world into God's land. I wanna turn this thing that you would naturally have growing in your, in your backyard into something that you're gonna tear up and you're gonna be in control of. I want, I want Egypt here in my backyard. That's what the author is trying to get you to understand. And that's why it's so important to be on uh, your, this Bible reading plan where, where you're constantly going through the Bible every year because all these data points are all connected. And when the author introduces something, it would have prompted a thought in the mind of the reader that is lost to us because we're not familiar enough with it. And this is one of those examples. So when Ahab says, I wanna tear up your vineyard and build a garden, spiritually, the heart of Ahab is saying, I want my backyard like Egypt. Scripturally, that's, how, that's the idea that the author is trying to connect to what Moses said in Deuteronomy. So with that in mind, the fact that Ahab has no respect for God's law, which is don't sell the property, and he wants to turn Egypt into, uh, excuse, excuse me, he wants to turn Israel into Egypt, this is the reason why judgment is coming. These first two verses explain to you why everything that's about to come next has to come. Because we've got leaders who have no desire to honor God with the thing that God has given them to honor him with, they wanna turn that thing into an idol that essentially serves their own purposes. They have no other desire. They don't wanna honor God, they wanna feed their bellies. They wanna take advantage of the land, they wanna pollute the soil in order to honor themselves. That's the problem. Let's continue, verse three. So Nabot, he said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. And so Ahab went into his house, vexed and sullen, because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed 
and turned away his face and he would eat no food. All right, so he's a three-year-old. So Jezebel, his wife, comes to check on him and says to him, why is your spirit so vexed that you eat no food? And he said to her, because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, give me your vineyard for money or else if it please you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he said to me, I will not give you my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife said to him, do you now govern Israel? Arise, eat bread and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she started writing letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. And she sent the letters to the elders and the leaders who lived with Naboth in his city. And she wrote in the letters, proclaim a fast and set Naboth as the head of the people. And then set two worthless men opposite of him and let them bring a charge against him saying, you have cursed God and the king and then take him out and stone him to death. And the men of the city, the elders, and the leaders who lived in the city did as Jezebel had sent word to them, as it was written in the letters that she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast and sent Nabot the head of the people, set Nabot at the head of the people. And the two worthless men came in and sat opposite, and the worthless men brought a charge against Nabot in the presence of the people, saying, Nabot cursed God and the king. And so they took him outside the city and stoned him to death with stones. And they sent to Jezebel, saying, Nabot has been stoned, he is dead. And as soon as Jezebel heard that Nabot had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Nabot the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you money for. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. And as soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab arose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Starting to see why Israel is under judgment. These are the leaders. And not just the king and the queen, but the elders and the leaders of the tribes. They're complicit. They're in on it. Everybody's in on it. The story is fascinating because Ahab wants his vegetable garden. He's told no, but he won't settle for no. His manipulative wife makes sure that the no turns into a yes. And she does it by manipulating the people. But even worse than Ahab and Jezebel's actions are the actions of the men who live in this country. Because Jezebel would have never been able to enact her plan had the men of the city, the leaders, the elders, not also been corrupt. And this is the problem. These false accusations, they foreshadow another innocent man in the New Testament where charges were brought against him and he was murdered. This story is a foreshadow of Christ and the the author wants you, the Spirit of God, wants you to consider the connections between Naboth and Christ. But the other thing that you have to consider is how prominent the leaders and the elders were in the plot against Christ, and the plot against Naboth. None of this would have transpired had it only been the top levels of leaders saying, I want this done. They need middle management to agree to their sin. And what Jezebel found was that middle management was happy to agree with the sin. This story articulates the moral decline of the nation that starts at the top and starts to trickle down to the people and eventually those lowest in the power room. The leaders start with rejecting God's word. God says, don't sell this property. Ahab says, I don't like that. I want it anyway. All right, well, in order to get what you want, you have to reject God's word and ignore the command. But that's not enough, because if you really want your way, you're going to have to find other people who are complicit in what you believe. And so the next thing that you've got to do is you've got to normalize sin to get what you want. The leaders say, I want the nation heading this direction. 
All right, well, if you want to head in that direction, you got to get people on board with you heading in that direction. Because if you don't, it's just you standing on a soapbox saying all the things that you want and no one's listening to you. And so how do you get to the place where the people of the nation want the same sin that the leaders of the nation want? You normalize sin so it doesn't seem like something that you shouldn't be doing. It seems like something that if you don't do, you're missing out on. Now, how do you normalize this? The same way that you normalize it today. Propaganda, social settings, dinner parties, social media. You do it with entertainment. You do it with movies. You normalize things like adultery. You create an entire genre of movies, romantic comedies that make it seem funny for a woman to be unfaithful to her husband or for a man to be unfaithful to his wife. And the reason why is because, man, some, there's, there's just, I'm so unhappy and there's somebody out there that's better for me and I just, I messed it up the first time, but man, if I could get it the second time. You normalize behavior that God says is sinful and it gets into the culture and it may not, it may not resonate on the first generation but you give it enough time and it becomes so normal. And eventually you've got television shows where some of your favorite characters live lives of sin and debauchery. They give themselves over to sexuality. They give themselves over to homosexuality. They give themselves over to, to normalizing the, the actual appearance. It is normal for a man to dress, to dress up in a dress. It is normal for a woman to act like a man normalize things that God commands are sinful so that across the board, no one asks questions about it anymore because that's normal. And soon you seem, anyone who asks questions, you're the crazy one. How do you get to a place? This is how you do it. You normalize the sin that the leaders want in order to get what they want, and you do it across the board so that everybody's on the same page and everyone agrees and, and everybody's, and they're in on it. And they're in on it because they want a part of it. And you, you can create some financial incentives. You can create some social score incentives that if you're not championing this cause or an advocate for this, then you look like an idiot or you look like somebody who's behind and somebody, we're going to ostracize you. This is how you do it. And so what happens is once that starts, and really you don't need people who are elected to do that. The people who are elected, the people who are in the top levels of, level, levels of leadership, who they need on their team are celebrities. They need sports stars. They need people who are famous in order to spread the propaganda of what is the new normal. And once that happens, your average 13-year-old girl can't tell the difference between what is right and what her favorite singer is telling her is right. That's how we get here. It's the same, this is happening at First Kings and it's happening today. And now the citizens are invited to participate in this moral decline. Hey, you wouldn't wanna miss out on this, would you? There is no, like your parents who are telling you to, to wait until marriage to have sex, no, 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 they're holding something back from you. The word of God is, is lying to you. There is something that you're missing if you don't give yourself over to this ideology unless you surrender yourself. You're not normal unless you send those pictures to your significant other or your boyfriend or your girlfriend. All of this perverse activity that, look, 20 years ago would have seen complete, like there's no way that would be normal. Oh, it's normal. And the trajectory we're heading, it's like somebody's putting their foot on the gas and there's no slowing down. How do we get, this is, this is how we get here. It starts with a guy like Ahab and Jezebel who wants something. And then they find people in the city who are leaders, who are complicit with it, who wanna normalize it. And then eventually it starts seeping into the average people and this just becomes normal. If you see something that you want, you don't ask for it, you don't pay for it. Next time Ahab's not even gonna ask, he's just gonna take it because he knows he can't. So my question when I'm reading this is, what would have happened if the citizens said no? What would have happened if one moral, upright man would have stood up and said, no, not in my family. 
You're, this is not normal. You will not be doing this. I'm sorry, but I'm taking your phone away from you. I'm sorry, but new rule in the house. You are not allowed to have your phone in your room with the door closed. End of story. We're not even discussing it. What would happen if parents told kids, you don't have privacy when I am responsible for your safety? What would happen if one righteous man had stood up to Jezebel when that letter came in, he tore it up and said, no, I will not bring false accusations against Nabot because your husband wants his vineyard. What if godly men stood up and refused the command of the nation, of the celebrities, of the leaders? What would happen? Let's go to verse 17. It says, the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Nabot, where he has gone to take possession. And I want you to say to him, thus says the Lord, have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, in the place where dogs lick up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your own blood. Ahab said to Elijah, so they finally, so Elijah gets the message, he goes and meets Ahab, and this is what Ahab says when he sees Elijah. Have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, oh, oh, I found you because you've sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahiah. For the anger to which you have provoked me, and because you have made Israel to sin. You remember those kings that I allowed to split the nation and take authority, and I told them to be men after my own heart, and then they rebelled? You remember, where are they? They're gone. Their entire family lineage has been wiped off the map. That's what's coming for you, Ahab. Verse 23, I got a message for Jezebel too. For Jezebel, the Lord also says, the dogs shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. That's Hebrew for not a great funeral. (laughs) He says, anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dogs will eat them too. And anyone who dies, anyone who, 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 excuse me, anyone of his who dies in the open country, the birds of the heaven shall eat. So in this story, unfortunately, no godly men stood up for Naboth, but the Lord stood up for Naboth because the Lord is on the side of the oppressed. He cares for those who are being taken advantage of by those who are over them. Those who are victims of the celebrity culture that normalize sin, the Lord is on their side. And so the Lord stands up and he brings judgment through Elijah and he tells Elijah, I want you to speak judgment over Ahab and Jezebel and destruction to his family. And the destruction is you're going to, your family lineage is going to be ended and there's not going to be a proper burial for you or your family. Dogs are going to eat your bodies out in the city. Now Ahab's response to this in 25 through 29 is that he repents He hears this and he is shocked. And the reason why he's shocked is because he's got just enough of that old Israelite in his heart, just enough of God's word that when he hears God speak like that, he shakes on the inside. Not enough to live it daily, but enough to hear it and shake. And so he repents and the Lord says to Elijah, did you hear how Ahab repented? Go and tell him that I'm going to spare the judgment of his family in his generation. He's still going to die, but he's not going to have to see his family lineage being wiped off the planet. I'm not going to make him watch his son die. I will give him peace in dying, and then after he's dead, I will wipe out his family lineage because of the sin that you have perpetuated in my country.
Now, the thing that stands out the most to me, and this is really what I want to draw your attention because this is echoed again in chapter 22, is there a con- there's, a, there's a contrast here between two kinds of men. The first kind of men that you see are men like Ahab, men who they grew up hearing the word of God. They know it, but they consider it secondary in their life. It is not of first importance, it is of second importance. These are the kind of men who hear the word of God, maybe they've read it, they're familiar with it because it comes up in popular culture, they know it, their dad maybe taught it to them, but didn't teach it as, son, we obey this because this is what God commands. No, they hear it and they just listen to it because they they think it's a moral way of living and there's a benefit to it, but you can kind of manipulate it and twist it if it doesn't necessarily serve your own purposes. God's word is there to benefit you when you need it, but you only really have to listen to it when you want to validate your own opinion. These are the men who pray in crisis, but don't pray daily. These are the men who experience loss or tragedy and immediately turn to the word of God, but their Bible, the pages still stick together because they never open it. This is Ahab. And this man is put up against another kind of man. This man is embodied in the guy Elijah. And he is the, word, he is the kind of man who doesn't just know the word. He's not just near it or surrounded by it. He's the kind of guy who treats it as primary in his life. When you look at Elijah, he's the kind of man who sees the word of God as the thing that shapes and molds his very opinion. Everything he sees, everything he says, the way he hears, the movies he goes to, what he allows on his phone, the kind of relationships he engages in, the kind of women he lets into his life, all of it is filtered through God's word, not his opinion or preference. This man... He's got a filter that is higher than Ahab's filter. Everything he does, everything he thinks, everything he says is filtered by this, and it cannot be changed, and it cannot be manipulated. It cannot be put on a shelf because today we want a vineyard, and then God tells us no. No, if God says no, then that's the end of it. If God says no, don't live with your girlfriend, that's the end of the story, we don't do it. If God says, don't put this smut before your eyes, you don't find a way to say, well, what about this kind of movie? No, you make the decision, I've made a covenant with my eyes and I will not look upon that garbage. I don't want sin to be normal in my life. I want to feel the way God feels about sin. I want to love what he loves and treasure what he loves and hate what he hates. This is the kind of a man Elijah is. And these two men are set next to each other because this theme is going to be mirrored in 22 and the author wants you to see that these two kinds of men, they also, they often live in the same culture right next to each other. They're exposed to the same things on a daily basis. They can sit next to each other in the same church, hear the same sermon every single week and live two very different lives. Go to 1 Kings chapter 22. For three years, Syria and Israel continued without war. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Now again, we've got, okay, the last thing we heard was that the king of Judah was Asa. Where is he? Why do we have a new king? The author is not interested in your curiosity for chronological order, right? That's not the point of the story. He's not here drawing you a map to outline a family tree. He's drawing the text out so that you understand these things, and he reorders stories in ways that make us confused. So Asa had a son named Jehoshaphat, and this is this guy. So Asa is dead. We'll come back and reference that later. It's not important to the author. All that's important is that this story is next after Ahab's story about Naboth's vineyard. So Jehoshaphat's the king of Judah, and Ahab is the king in the north of Israel. The king of Israel, verse 3, said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and we keep quiet and do, not make, and do not take it out of the hand of the king of Syria? 
And he said to Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to battle at Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I I am as you are. My people are as your people. My horses as your horses. All right. So the bond between Judah and Israel has changed. They're on friendly terms. Syria has been bombarding Israel in the north and and they've taken one of the northern cities, Ramoth Gilead. Ahab's not happy that the city has been taken. He wants to take it back from Syria, but he needs two armies. So Israel and Judah are back on the same team and they They want to go and help uh, the king Ahab of Israel get Ramoth Gilead back, which is just a city in the north. And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, okay, before we do this, we need to inquire first of the Lord. All right, so props to Jehoshaphat. He's the kind of dude who wants to know what the Lord thinks. So this is a good idea, but does the Lord think this is a good idea? And verse six, the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, shall I go to battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? And they said, go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat says to Ahab, so there's 400 prophets telling Ahab, do it, bro. The Lord is on your side. Okay, we know that the Lord is not on Ahab's side. Jehoshaphat knows that the Lord is not on Ahab's side. So what what does Jehoshaphat say after the 400 prophets tell Ahab, 100%, go after it? Jehoshaphat says, verse 7, is there not here another prophet of the Lord of whom we may inquire? (laughs) And the king of Israel, Ahab, says to Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord. His name is Micaiah, the son of Imlah, but I hate him. (laughs) And I hate him because he never prophesies good concerning me, only evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. The king of Israel summoned an officer and said, all right, bring quickly Micaiah, the son of Imlah. Now the king of Israel and and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones, arrayed in their robes at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Chinana, made for himself horns of iron and said, thus says the Lord, with these you shall push the Syrians until they are destroyed. So they're really making a show of this. And all the prophets prophesied the same thing and said, go up to Ramoth Gilead and triumph for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. All right, let's, let's pause. So Ahab and Israel, uh, Ahab of Israel and Jehoshaphat of Judah are forming this alliance. I want to draw attention to the fact that when Jehoshaphat came and said, I will join you in alliance, but let's ask the Lord. Ahab asked 400 prophets to give him feedback Back in 1 Kings 18, 19, there were 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. And Elijah commanded Ahab, bring all 450 of Baal and 400 of Asherah to Mount Carmel so we can have a showdown. Guess who didn't show up? The 400 prophets of Asherah. And here they are again. So when Ahab asks the prophets to give me feedback on what does the Lord think about going to take Ramoth Gilead, he asked the 400 prophets of Asherah. And they're telling him, do it, it's going to be good. But Jehoshaphat wasn't convinced. And the reason why Jehoshaphat wasn't convinced is because he is the kind of man who knows the difference between flattery and a convicting word of God. This is the kind of guy who knows that when the man of God is preaching, He's doing it for the approval of the people or he's doing it because he loves the people and he's going to give them a hard word if they need it. Jehoshaphat is the kind of king that knows when the congregation has itching ears that like uh, Paul warned uh, Timothy out in 2 Timothy 4.3. Be careful in latter days because people will become allergic to the truth and they'll just want to seek out people who will tell them what they want to hear. Jehoshaphat knows that that's not a New Testament issue. It's a human issue, and it starts all the way back in the Old Testament. Leaders want to hear their own opinions validated. They don't want to hear the truth. And this permeates people and congregations, too, to the point where people will choose to go to another church because they don't like hearing the truth. They'd rather hear someone affirm what they already believe. So Jehoshaphat is this guy in the story who seems hungry for something more. He wants somebody 
who's bound to God's word. I don't want a prophet who's gonna tell you what you wanna hear. Is there anybody out here who's so tethered to God and his word that will tell you the truth even if it means that you'd kill him because you don't like what he has to say? Is there a guy like that? And Ahab's like, yeah, there's a guy like that, but I can't stand him. Jehoshaphat's like, bring me that guy because I want somebody who values what, what God values and will speak what God speaks. Now this man, Micaiah, he's here, and I just want you to picture what he's walking into. He's walking into the throne room, and you've got two kings sitting on their thrones in decked out robes with 400 prophets dancing around, shouting out, go to war, you're gonna be fine, war, war, war. The war machine is all spun up. They're even making horns. You're going you're to gore them in battle with these silver horns. You're going to have victory. And Micaiah walks in. I just want you to imagine the pressure he's under to conform to what everybody, like it doesn't matter what the Lord says. Come in and say what everybody else is saying. Let's go to verse 13. So the messenger who went to summon Micaiah said to him, all right, so he's already given him, Micaiah's getting some words before he comes in. The messenger says, behold, the words of the prophets with one accord, everybody's in favor. They're in favor of the king. So let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. It doesn't matter what God tells you, don't say that. Say what everybody else is already saying. And this is Micaiah's response, verse 14. As the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that's what I'll speak. And when he had gone to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we refrain? And he answers this king, go up and triumph. The Lord will give it to you in the hand of the king. And the king said to him, how many times shall I make you swear that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? I know you're lying because you only ever say things that I don't like. And he said to him, this is Micaiah, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his own home. And the king of Israel turned to Jehoshaphat and said, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good for me, good concerning me, but evil? I told you. Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. Uh Uh-oh. He's about to breathe fire. Micaiah said, all right, listen up. Here's the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said one thing and another said another. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I'll entice him. And the Lord said to him, by what means? And he said, I will go out and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, you are to entice him and you shall succeed, go out and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all of these prophets because the Lord has declared disaster for you. Then Zedekiah, the son of Kanana, came near and struck Micaiah on the cheek. How did the Spirit of the Lord go for me to speak to you? Essentially, he said, what did I tell you to say? You didn't say it, so I'm gonna punch you in the mouth. And Micaiah said, behold, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide for yourself. The king of Israel said, seize Micaiah, take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, king's son, and he said, Thus says the king, put this fellow in prison and feed him meager rations of bread and water until I come in peace. And Micaiah says, if you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. Excuse me, uh, if you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, hear all you people. So essentially he says, "Um, if I'm right, you won't be coming back. So I told you in the last chapter, there's this, kind of man that Elijah embodies. And in chapter 22, Micaiah is the kind of man we're looking for. 
It's this man again. He's the man who declares what the Lord says. No lies, no manipulations, no warm fuzzies. He's a bound man, bound to God, not Ahab and Jezebel. His devotion is to God and his word. And what does this bound man declare when he walks into the throne room and all the pressures on 400 prophets all saying the same thing? Are you really going to be the one guy who stands up and says something different? Micaiah walks in and he declares, here's what's going to happen. Ahab's going to die. And the way he tells it, it kind of upsets our theological apple cart a little bit because he says, here's what God has declared. He has decided that Ahab will die at Ramoth Gilead, but what he didn't decide is how it was going to happen. God has decreed that a thing will happen, but how it's going to happen is left up to his divine counsel. He says to them, guys, bring me a plan. How are we going to get Ahab dead at Ramoth Gilead. And some of the spirits came forward and recommended one thing and a couple recommended some of something else. And then this divine being, the spirit, this angel comes forward and says, I have a plan. He says, what's your plan? He says, I'm going to go put a lying spirit in the mouths of the prophets. And God says, that's really good. That's, that's really good. Go do it. Now, this entire story is fascinating because it's an interesting study in the free will among humans and also apparently spiritual beings, but that's not where we're going. I digress today because we need to focus in on what actually happens because in 29 through 53, the end of the story, Ahab and Jehoshaphat go to war. And Jehoshaphat, he seems to be a kind of guy who loves the Lord, but isn't real smart because when they go out to battle, Ahab says, I tell you what, I'm going to put on civilian clothes and you wear your royal robes. And Jehoshaphat's just like, okay. So they go to battle and Ahab's in street clothes and Jehoshaphat looks like the king. And when they go to war, the Syrians from a far, from a long way off, they see a guy in robes and they go after Jehoshaphat. But as soon as they go after him, Jehoshaphat cries out. We don't know what he cries out, but he probably says, I'm not Ahab. And when he cries out, the Syrians say, that's not the guy we're looking for. And so they turn around and start heading away from the battle. But as they turn, one random dude takes out a bow and an arrow and just randomly shoots it into the sky towards the Israelites, not aiming at anything, just like, all right, we're heading out, just And this arrow finds the one spot on Ahab's armor where the two pieces meet and it strikes him and it kills him. Now, this story is fascinating to me. The reason why it's fascinating because it brings us to some interesting conclusions about God. The first thing it tells us, it doesn't matter how powerful you think you are, your power often blinds you to the power you actually have. That the more in control you are, the less you actually are in control. Then when God has decreed a thing, it doesn't matter what you can do about it, you're not going to change it. In the same way from Daniel chapter 4, when Nebuchadnezzar had been decreed by these same spiritual beings, these watchers who came down and said, hey, you're going to be given insanity for seven years because of your pride. We're going to drive you out of your mind. You're going to go out and live in the wilderness, and you're going to eat grass like an ox, and your nails are going to grow long, and you're not going to be in your right mind. But at the end of seven years, you're going to learn your lesson. We're going to take that from you, and you're going to give you your brain back, and you're going to be just as you were before. Uh, Is there anything I can do about that? Nope. It's how you're going to learn to deal with your pride. Ahab, he can't get away from it. This is a thing that the Lord had decreed and you can't avoid it. But even more than that, the thing that stands out to me is this thing that I mentioned in 21. It's the contrast of men. And this is where we're going to finish today. I want you looking at the kind of people who live close to God's word, where it rubs off a little here and there. They're familiar with it. Maybe they go to church with their spouse. Maybe they go to church with their, their, their girlfriend or their boyfriend. But, but at the end of the day, it's really only rubbing off. It's on the outside of them. God's word is commands. What he says about a thing, they're just kind of here standing next to the person, but not really on the inside. And that's 
the other kind of person that we're seeing. The contrast of two ways of living is how 1 Kings 21 and 22 ends. It's the kind of person who thinks, I probably should read my Bible, and the kind of person who, who says, I am so hungry that if I don't read it, I'm gonna die. It's the kind of person who says, it's probably a good idea to go to church. I probably should pray because things aren't going really well. I should probably change course in a couple things. And the kind of person who says, if I don't have my daily time with the Lord, if I'm not guided by him, if he's not directing my state, I'm completely lost. If the spirit of God is not moving, if he's not stirring on the inside of me, I don't know what I'm living for. There is nothing, there's no steady diet that I'm on here on the world where these things are feeding me and I'm kind of getting sustenance. I have, I have weaned myself off of the things of this world and all I care about is God. These are the men that you see in this text. You see it in Elijah, you see it in Micaiah. And then when you jump forward in the New Testament, you see guys like Paul and James and Peter living like this too. Guys who are tethered to the word of God. They're bound to it. They walk in submission, not because it's a good idea, but because it's, that's the only thing they've got. Where else would we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. This is everything to me. These bound men that we see all throughout here, they won't bend as society changes, as some new norm comes through this phone and tells us act this way, think this way, talk this way. You can't be convinced that your convictions need to change because we're living in a modern age. There's no accommodation to sin. They're tethered to this. They're bound by it. It's almost like they're slaves to God and his word. And the question we have to ask ourselves is if we see guys like this over and over and over, and often in scripture they're placed right next to a guy who isn't like that, then it seems like we are presented on a regular basis with two options to follow the Lord. The first being the kind of option that we see in guys like Ahab, who they surround themselves with people who know just enough of the word of God to make it seem like they're holy. They obey just enough to get by and to feel like, yeah, I'm headed to heaven, but man, I'm gonna have a good time on the way. Those kind of men are set right against this other kind of men. These kind of men who are just bound and tethered to God's word. And the question is, when you look at scripture presenting those two options before you, what kind of man or woman are you? Does your faith look like the kind of faith like Ahab or other weak men who give in to whatever the social norm is? Are you the kind of weak men and weak women like the Israelites, like the leaders of the tribes, the elders, that when presented with an opportunity to sin so that you can gain some notoriety among the leaders, it will, if you just do this one compromised thing, it will, it will raise your credibility in the eyes of these other people who you see are so important. Would you give in on that? Or are you the kind of man that says, I don't even want their attention anyway. I don't care what they think of me because I've only got one person I care about and that is the Lord. What does he think about me? The question scripture presents before us is, are you a servant, are you a slave? Are you doing the kind of things that Christ demands? Or are you doing the kind of things that are convenient to you and conveniently leaving these commands um, in the book that you don't ever read? Are you the kind of man like Micaiah who would walk in obedience even if it cost your own reputation? When presented with the opportunity to walk in obedience and make much of your God, that you would rather walk in disobedience and make much of yourself. Now be careful, because when I say that, no one in here is gonna pick the second one. But the way you know what you've picked is by the way you live. So you can't just say, well of course, like I am, I'm bound to the Lord, I obey him. Okay, well let's test that. I want you to start going through your checkbook. I want you to look at your calendar. I want you to open up YouTube and I want you to start scrolling through your video history. I want you to look at your internet browsing history. I want you to be honest with yourself. Is what you're saying about yourself 
true to what you want to be true because if it's not, the Lord is merciful and he is offering an opportunity to repent and be kind, be, become that kind of man and woman who is bound to God's word. You can get on the trajectory where you are on a steady diet of God's word and what he loves is what you love and what you hate is what he hates, but don't lie to yourselves and sit here and say, I'm already there when you know deep down if you stood before the Lord and the evidence was presented, it would be to the contrary. So the invitation today is to consider what God's word is giving us. It is two pictures. A man who is weak and will give in to the temptations of his wife or women. Men who are weak among society who will give in to what those above him want him to do, or men and women who are so tethered to God's word that it matters not what is happening around him in culture. He only cares about the Lord and he walks in obedience to Christ. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we come before you today with a plea, a plea to be searched and known in a way that makes us feel unbelievably uncomfortable. We invite the Holy Spirit to search us, to know us, to expose us, to expose our lies, to get us to a place where we stop lying to ourselves about where we are and our devotion. And we look at men like Elijah and Micaiah and say, that's the kind of example I wanna follow. And we stop giving in to the easy, delicious, temptations or opportunities that are presented to us to constantly erode that moral character and that desire to walk in obedience. Make us the kind of people who have your word wrapped around our arms so that everything we touch is filtered through your word. Let us be the kind of people like the priests of old who have wrapped your word around our head and set it like a frontlet between our eyes so that everything we see, everything we smell, everything we taste, everything we hear, everything we consume is filtered through the word of God. Let us be the kind of people like the priests of old who have been marked by your name holy unto the Lord. Draw your people closer and bring them into step with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.